it's the ability to bounce back from stress or hardship. And it's, it's been popping up a lot lately, especially as we grapple with specific challenges that are in our, uh, in our world as, as a whole. But resilience is more than a trendy idea. It's how we humans cope with our ever-changing environment. So today I intend to focus on personal resilience, both as an individual coping with adverse circumstances and as an individual who might be responsible for leading others through adversity. I hope you will discover some ideas and practical tools you can use to unlock your resilience. My interest in this topic came to an apex in 2014 when my daughter Samantha and I climbed a 500 foot granite fin in Idaho's City of Rocks. It was a beautiful, warm, sunny bluebird day. The climb is executed in four pitches or stages. So once at the top, I set up for a rappel and noticed the rope needed a, a minor adjustment. I made the poor decision to unclip from my safety system. Now a mishap was unlikely, but the consequence would be dire. Unfortunately for me, I experienced the unlikely when my foot caught some loose pebbles. In horror, my daughter watched me slip from sight and careen off the summit into the abyss. I fell 115 feet onto a hard granite ledge. Projected back into the air, I finally came to rest upside down, pinned between the wall and a stone flake. So a rescue operation ensued over the next four hours deep into the darkness of night. Ambulances assembled at a base camp with a technical crew that climbed to my location. Life flight was ordered and uh, worst of all, a National Guard utility chopper was on standby to retrieve my remains if I should perish. Over the next several weeks, there was a, a lot of time for reflection. I replayed the event in my mind again and again, what I should have or could have, what might have, and what ultimately did. I scoured my brain for clues and answers. How did I make such a foolish decision? Did I fail or was I a failure? And what did it say about my future? This experience became a defining moment and fueled my affinity for the subject of resilience. You know, we spend our lives avoiding adversity or, or at least avoiding the pain, yet we awkwardly fall down into the scarred years of conscious living and most of us are able to get back up. But I wondered how? I learned that resilience requires living at the edge, learning to how to live fully, richly, consciously in the presence of the unknown. It means accepting the vulnerability that is our human endowment. So what is resilience? Resilience is our ability to adapt to adversity, trauma, tragedy, and threats. And it won't prevent you from experiencing difficulty or distress, but it will give you an ability to see past them, find enjoyment in life, and better handle stress. Emotional pain and discouragement are normal for, pe for people suffering adversity. In fact, the road to resilience is likely to involve considerable emotional distress. Now, research has shown that resilience is a rather ordinary thing. It's a, it's a trait that we are all born with, but it's also a state of being that fluctuates depending on our life situation at any given time. We may gracefully navigate one setback while struggling with the next. We can increase our capacity to spring, to spring back from adversity by engaging in productive behaviors, thoughts, and actions that can be learned and practiced. Developing resilience is a personal journey because we don't all react the same to challenging events. An approach to building resilience that works for one person might not work for another. Resilience is consistently associated with six factors, an active coping style, physical exercise, a positive outlook, a moral compass, social support, cognitive flexibility. These are attributes, but what can we do to strengthen ours? A motivated person can develop a set of keys to strengthen all of these factors and become more resistant to everyday stressors and unexpected adversity. There, there are countless keys, and I'm just going to share 10 today, and you can use these keys to unlock your resilience. Periodically, 
I'm going to share a slide that looks like this. It's the, the sort of a blackboard or a green board, a chalkboard uh, scenario uh, format. It, this signifies that it's a practical measure or exercise that you can use to develop a key. We'll explore how these keys can be implemented for individual strength and in your role as a leader. Uh, before we begin, you might wish to open a notepad. Since there are numerous keys you could add to your set, jot down the ones that appeal to you as I mention them. And perhaps you'll think of other keys as we go along exploring. You can write those down as well. The suggestions that I'm going to share today uh, come from a wealth of research and sources, including UC Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center, Forbes Coaches Council, and the American Psychological Association. Resilient people see adversity as temporary and limited in scope. You can't change that highly stressful events happen, but you can change how you interpret and respond to them. Oftentimes, and maybe too often, we fix ourselves to a specific path or a method rather than to the destination itself. Other times, we do the opposite. We fail to see when a destination loses its relevance or appeal. In either case, we might just discover that a course change is more glorifying or liberating than we ever imagined. As you navigate a shift, note subtle ways in which you might already be making progress or feeling glimmers of hope. Expect and be okay with feelings of grief as, as well. This is only natural. I happen to believe that uh, humans are not so resistant to change as they are resistant to being changed. If we perceive a sense of choice and control in a decision to change, our experience is more likely gratifying. We can ask ourselves, is the event or situation an obstacle to the method or to the destination? In what ways did this setback challenge my assumptions about the destination or methods to get there? What other ways can I accomplish this? List the, all the alternatives from pedestrian and mundane to radical or transformational. Your criteria for selecting viable options should include how much it is within your control. When something bad happens, we often relive the event over and over in our heads, rehashing the pain. This process is called rumination. It's, it's like a cognitive, cognitive spinning of the wheels, and it continues to shake our confidence. Resilient people learn how to reframe and reset after a setback and often define meaning in their experiences. Changing the narrative fosters confidence in your ability to solve problems and trust your instincts. Nurturing positive emotions decreases autonomic activity in the nervous system. It diminishes symptoms of stress, broadens your focus, and allows negative events to be put into perspective. Leaders find that authentic narratives become powerful ways to acknowledge fears that naturally surface in times of crisis, while at the same time framing the opportunity that can be achieved if employees come together and commit to overcoming difficult challenges. Neuroimaging studies show that individuals who are able to reframe adversity have strong top-down control of emotions. They can modify their reaction to stress and adversity. Leadership strategist Joyelle Crawford suggests four simple steps that help with this using the acronym RISE. R stands for reflect, reflect on what happened. Dig deep and recognize the contributing factors that led to the challenge. I, identify what you want to have happen now and identify how the challenge you experienced helps you get there. S, strategize, strategize an action plan. Things you can actually do that are within your control. What strengths did the challenge reveal and what might you need to change, correct, or improve? And finally, execute the plan. Finding meaning is vital to resilience. It, it helps us craft the narrative we've just been talking about and helps us gain a sense of control. People often learn something about themselves and may find that they've grown in some respect as a result of adversity. Many people who have experienced tragedies and hardships have re reported that afterward they feel be they have better relationships, 
greater sense of strength, even while feeling vulnerable, an increased sense of self-worth and a heightened appreciation for life. Holocaust survival survivor uh, Viktor Frankl wrote of the importance of making meaning. Despite suffering for years in Nazi concentration camps, Frankl wrote that he gained the opportunity to exercise inner strength and be brave, dignified, and unselfish. He struggled to survive because he came to believe that his suffering had a purpose, to live, to teach others about his experience. An extensive study in 1988 revealed that participants who engage in expressive writing for four days were healthier six weeks later and happier up to even three months later. Writing specifically focused in this, in this case, the activity that is suggested here specifically focuses on difficult experiences and the feelings surrounding them. It allows participants to be with and explore upsetting emotions. Upon reflection, participants found they naturally evolved into discovering important issues, patterns, and meaning in difficult experiences that resulted in positive perspectives and self-motivation. Evidence suggests that undertaking and mastering difficult tasks is effective in increasing resilience. Successfully overcoming challenges improves self-confidence and may actually alter the neurobiology of the stress response. We must avoid detaching from problems that we have to face. While a short break could be helpful, you will be better served by making and executing a plan to address them. The previous two keys are helpful once you've gained enough distance from the experience to get some perspective. Facing fear, however, is a present concern. The Greater Good Science Center suggests experimenting with small doses of a fear-inducing activity in a safe context. Then repeat the activity until you start to fear, feel the fear dissipate. Gradually increase the challenge. You can continue to incrementally like, ratchet up the challenge until you reach your goal. Your fear may never be fully extinguished, but hopefully it will hold less power over you and not prevent you from achieving important goals. In the words of Mark Twain, courage is not the absence of fear, it is acting in spite of it. We know that continuous development is critical for growth. Reading the literature in your field, attending conferences, and continuing to hone your craft is very important. But stepping away from familiar sources to read or experience something completely different may widen your perspective and help you gain new insights. Stepping beyond the familiar may prevent you from getting mired in the, in the stale or conventional thinking that could have contributed to your present circumstances. Embrace something different, inspirational, something, engage in an interesting new hobby, get together with folks who think differently, learn something you know little about, or uh, simply experience something foreign to you or that makes you uncomfortably, uncomfortable. Uh, purposely stepping away from comfort can give you a renewed focus and a boost to resilience that you're that you're looking for sometimes we mistakenly equate being busy with being successful or productive and busy people have an incredible ability to expand their tasks to the amount of time they have available while being busy is not inherently bad it may erode our effectiveness at times being busy can sneak into our self-image, causing us to believe that being busy demonstrates our personal worth. Instead, it often saps our energy and innovation and creates negative stress. If you ever feel like you're just surviving, check yourself because you may be in a self-defeating pattern. Jennifer Cohen of the Forbes Coaches Council suggests four steps to redirect this pattern and recharge productivity. Step one is focusing on one thing at a time. What is the one thing that will deliver you the most results first? Do that. Do you have multiple priorities? Chunk your time based on your goals and the tasks you need to get things done first. 
That way you can stay focused on one topic instead of bouncing around from one thing uh, to another all day long. Second, master your calendar. Dedicate un un uninterrupted time and build in breaks and buffers to recharge and address unexpected obstacles. Don't let time-sucking activities like clearing your inbox rob your day. Third, think smaller. Break large goals into smaller objectives and tasks. And fourth, eliminate distractions. Establish a productive environment and communicate boundaries and availability ahead of time to those with whom you interact. Don't spread yourself too thin. The so-called multitasking often leads to mistakes, hurried short shortfalls, and undue stress. Sherry Nassim of the Center for Ex Executive Excellence also suggests leaders retool meetings to schedule 15 minutes of white space to record and reflect your before charging into the next meeting or charging into the next project. Building white space throughout your day will give you the time you need to turn information into knowledge and then to take that knowledge and gain new insight. Stress is as much a physical as a mental phenomenon. Physical activity has been shown to improve emotional hardiness. It lifts the mood and improves memory. It releases hormones, activates neurotransmitters, stimulates nerve growth, increases brain plasticity, plasticity and a host of other benefits. It enhances our capacity to adapt to stressful situations. Good leaders need keen self-awareness. Pay attention to your own needs and feelings. Engage in activities that you enjoy and find rejuvenating. You may find that a strenuous physical challenge resets your mind, or you might just find that a simple walk through a park has the same effect. Keeping yourself in good physical health keeps your mind and body primed to deal with situations that require resilience. Individuals with strong social support tend to be more resilient than those without. Social support can encourage active coping, increase feelings of self-worth, and help a person put problems into perspective. Don't overlook mentors, colleagues, or experts that will give you honest feedback with your best interest at heart. Leaders have additional responsibilities to connect others when setbacks affect an entire work unit. Deloitte Global's CEO, Punit Renjan offers that it's important to recognize and address the emotions of your employees. In times of crisis, he observes, leading companies adopt a policy of shorter, more frequent communication based on what they do know at that time and filling in the details later on. In the absence of a narrative from you, however, your teams may start to fill in the void and with misinformation and assumptions. Setting a regular cadence with a clear voice is critical. Renjan suggests that in times of crisis, trust is paramount. Trust starts with transparency, telling what you know and admitting what you don't. Trust is also a function of the relationship you've built between you and your employees. Lastly, trust depends on the past experience others have had with you. How reliable have you been when it really mattered? In essence, trust can be strengthened, it's actually strengthened during trying times by demonstrating your ability to address unanticipated situations and maintain a steady commitment to address the needs of all your stakeholders. In the midst of crisis, the, the famous observation that the, the medium is the message, it rings even more true. Many psychologists assert that the majority of communication happens non-verbally. So emails, texts, and tweets, they're absent of the voice, intonation, eye contact, and body language that you, we humans rely on. When you're unable to meet in person, encourage more use of video, especially to connect emotionally with your teams. It turns out that your life is based on a true story. Your story is uniquely you 
and the combination of challenges and obstacles you face are part of that story. You carry it with you wherever you go. Find courage to own your story for what it is. As alluded to before, our stories should not be poor me sagas or a polished list of excuses, but a series of noble lessons that have actually transformed us. When you share your lessons with others, you contribute to a better world. This might take some practice as it calls for us to be honest and to some extent vulnerable. It also requires us to experience compassion for ourselves. Leadership coach Deborah Goldstein suggests leaders who adopt the practice of self-compassion will become more resilient. Having failed is a lot different from being a failure. Self-kindness carves out room for improvement and encourages the creativity needed for future success. It also provides a model to those that you lead that in order to ultimately succeed, you must take measured risks that sometimes just don't pan out. One exercise offered by Dr. Kristen Neff asks participants to reflect on a challenge as a close friend might. When we set aside harmful self-criticism and consider the constructive support we might offer a friend in the same situation, it may provide clues to how we could better treat ourselves. The final key I'd like to share concerns action. Much of resilience does happen in the brain with self-coaching and conditioning that creates a fertile mindset. Until we take action, however, we will not experience the enlightened transformation that we seek. The final step requires us to take nice ideas and turn them into decisive actions. This is best done by formally recording the commitments that we make to ourselves and others and then tracking them to completion. Evaluating our progress and celebrating our milestones helps us mark decisive actions in time. So let's review the 10 keys I've shared today. See crises as surmountable. Change the narrative. Find the silver lining. Face your fears. Step outside your bubble. Focus on recharging. Care for yourself physically. Connect with people. Own your story. And take decisive action. I hope some of these are useful to you. I wish I could have, I, that I could say I've demonstrated resilience in all moments of my life. Uh, but it's a it's a work in progress for sure. So I would like to extend a challenge that I'm willing to join you in pursuing. Discover and experiment with keys you need to unlock your resilience. Share one key with another person and share your story and triumph. Others may find inspiration for their own resilient story. So here's the conclusion to part of my story I shared at the beginning. Following surgery, extensive physical therapy, and a few years of progressively difficult challenges, I regained strength and confidence. The psychology was the most difficult hurdle. I also neglected to mention that I was born with an acute fear of heights that kept me from descending a set of stairs until I was nearly four years old. My fear of falling was not only justified, but very much realized. Managing my fear became part of my narrative. So imagine a kid so frightened by heights that as an adult, he can still recall the terror of sitting in a high chair. He grows up, falls 115 feet off of a cliff, then proceeds, proceeds to climb an iconic mountain like the Grand Teton. If I ever dreamed of climbing again, it was imperative that I get back on the rock as soon as possible. I had close friends and family to support me. Eight weeks after my fall, I convinced a friend to belay me uh, on, a short rocks, on a short rock face in Logan Canyon. It was a small milestone toward my larger goal to climb the Grand, De the, climb the Grand Teton.
So accompanied by a, a team of competent and trusted friends, I stepped onto the summit on an early August morning. The valley stretched out thousands of feet below. The crests of jagged pinnacles danced beneath. Um, it was a sort of metaphor for the adversity I had experienced to get there and the resilience I had worked hard to unlock. May you unlock your resilience, own your story, and live vigorously as an individual and as a leader in these tumultuous times. Thank you for your service to the people of Utah. I'm going to hand it back to Shane for any questions. And following the q and I'll share a two and a half minute uh, video from the final 500 feet of the summit. Be sure to look for our announcement for Blink Think or Kitchen Sink, How Leaders Make Effective Decisions, presented by Dan Chase on June 10th, and additional sessions of DHRM's Off the Shelf Leadership Series. Shane? All right. Everybody, thanks for your participation and everything. Um, just a few questions went through. Well, um, mostly one. A lot of people want to see this again. So we will send out a link most likely later today to where you can view it. Um, any other questions for JJ? I guess not. Okay. Thank you all for attending today.